Hi everyone, we're talking about the sexually transmitted infection known as trichomoniasis in this lesson. So we're going to talk about risk factors for getting it, how it is contracted, we'll also talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So as was just mentioned, trichomoniasis is a sexually transmitted infection, or STI, and it is due to an infection with a parasitic protozoa known as trichomonas vaginalis. So this is a protozoa. It's going to be a single-celled organism with a nucleus. It's about the size of a white blood cell, and it has four flagella, and flagella are these whip-like tails that allow it to move around. So it allows for motility of these organisms. And these organisms can spread from individual to individual through sexual contact and cause infection. And we'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about the pathophysiology in the next slide. Now, trichomoniasis is one of the most common STIs, and in fact, it is the most common non-viral STI. And it commonly occurs as a co-infection with other STIs like chlamydia and gonorrhea. Now, the risk factors for getting trichomonas vaginalis infections is a variety of high-risk sexual activities. Now, these can include unprotected sexual activities and multiple sexual partners. Now, the Prevalence of this condition is estimated to be anywhere from 0.5 to 3% of the general population. Some high-risk groups will have higher prevalences, and even these numbers are likely underreported numbers. So there's likely more individuals who have trichomoniasis than the numbers we can actually see. So let's talk about how trichomonas vaginalis infects individuals to cause trichomoniasis. So as mentioned before, it's through sexual contact. So what will happen is if an individual is infected, they will have these trichomonas vaginalis organisms. And these organisms, like we mentioned before, are motile. They can move around on their own. And they're going to reside in vaginal secretions, urethral secretions, and prostatic secretions. So they can reside in the prostate as well. And they're going to multiply. So if you have a few of them, they're going to multiply. And they will multiply by what we call longitudinal binary fission. And what this means is that essentially the organism is split down the middle. One organism into two. So this is binary fission. And they can spread from these secretions to other sexual partners. This is how they can spread. Now some other information with regards to the transmission and pathophysiology and the summary of what we just talked about includes the following. Humans are the only host for trichomonas vaginalis, so they're not going to be found in other species. As mentioned before, they're present in vaginal secretions of females and urethral and prostatic secretions of males. And transmission occurs via sexual intercourse. And what will happen is when an individual actually contracts this organism, the trichomonas vaginalis will actually damage epithelial cells via contact with those cells and release of cytotoxic chemicals. So it can damage the vaginal lining and some of the parts of the urethra as well. And this is why we can see an increased risk or a higher likelihood of having a co-infection with another STI because that protective epithelial barrier has been compromised by this organism. Furthermore, this organism can actually increase the vaginal pH. So it can increase the vaginal pH above 4.5, meaning that the vaginal environment has changed. Normally, the vaginal environment is going to be more acidic, but this organism is going to decrease the acidity of that environment, allowing itself to increase in number, but also allowing other bacterial species and other organisms to multiply as well. So that protective acidic vaginal environment is not going to be present. It's not going to suppress the growth of other organisms such as bacterial species. And this can increase the likelihood of other conditions like bacterial vaginosis. And then one last point I want to mention is that we talked about this being transmitted via sexual intercourse, but it can also be transmitted vertically, meaning that it can be transmitted from one parent to the other. So during delivery, during birth, a female can transmit this to their newborn baby. And when an individual does get this or they contract this organism, it takes about 4 to 28 days on average for patients to start experiencing symptoms. So it can be delayed with regards to seeing these symptoms. So the incubation period is 4 to 28 days. So let's talk about the clinical features of having this condition. So a couple important points to make note of here. Almost 50% of females are going to be asymptomatic. So even if they are infected with this organism, 50% of females are not going to have any signs or symptoms at all. In male patients, almost all are going to be asymptomatic. So even if they have these organisms in their urethra or their prostate, they're not going to experience symptoms most of the time. But when there are symptoms, we can see symptoms like vaginal discharge, 
This is going to be the most common symptom. This vaginal discharge may be bloody or purulent. So because those organisms are actually damaging the epithelial cells in the vagina, it can cause bleeding to occur. And there can be some pus mixed in with the vaginal discharge as well. The discharge can also be a green color or a yellow color. So often the characteristic color of vaginal discharge in trichomoniasis is going to be green. We can also see issues with abnormal vaginal odor. So the odor is often going to be described as musty. And in some cases, it may smell fishy, although this is more likely to be bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis, the vaginal discharge in bacterial vaginosis is more likely to be a fishy smell than it would be in trichomoniasis. We can also see issues with dyspareunia. Dyspareunia is going to be pain during intercourse. We can also see issues with vulvovaginal irritation and burning, vulvovaginal itching, postcoital bleeding, so bleeding after intercourse. And then in some cases, we may see pain in the lower abdomen, dysuria or cloudy urine. So dysuria is a burning sensation when urinating. And then in those rare male patients that experience symptoms, they may have prostatitis, which is an inflammation of the prostate gland. We mentioned that these organisms can reside in the prostate. Epididymitis, so this is an inflammation of the epididymis. And testicular pain. Testicular pain may also occur in some patients as well, although again, these are going to be more rare. And then with regards to newborn transmission, if a newborn baby has trichomoniasis, they often are going to have other systemic symptoms. So they can not only have vaginitis, which is an inflammation of the vagina, but they can have issues with urinary tract infections and respiratory infections as well. So this is going to be important in newborns who have trichomoniasis. And not only those symptoms we just talked about, but trichomoniasis can also cause a multitude of complications. Some include infertility, so there's a higher rate of infertility in patients who are infected with trichomoniasis. There can be pregnancy issues. There can be issues with cervical neoplasia. So these organisms may actually cause issues with the cells of the cervix multiplying too much. So there can be an increased risk for cervical cancer. We can also see issues with post-operative issues. So if there's some operation, especially gynecological operation, there can be post-operative issues if they are infected with trichomoniasis. As mentioned before, there's an increased risk of STIs like chlamydia and gonorrhea. We talked about that epithelial barrier again because trichomonas vaginalis can cause damage to those epithelial cells. That protective barrier is going to be compromised, which is going to increase the likelihood of other infections as well. And not only chlamydia and gonorrhea, but having trichomoniasis can also increase your risk for getting HIV as well. So this is all going to be related to those risk factors we talked about before, those high risk sexual activities. And then we can also see increased risk of pelvic inflammatory disease as well. And as I mentioned before, these organisms can reside in the prostate gland. And there has been some evidence suggesting that having trichomoniasis can increase the risk of having prostate cancer or benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. So this is something else I want to make note of as well. Let's talk about how this condition is diagnosed by clinicians. So it's important to test for this in all patients with vaginal discharge. So if there's any vaginal discharge, it's important to check for trichomoniasis. So a history and physical examination is going to be important. If a cervical examination is performed, you may see a strawberry cervix, and this occurs in roughly 40% of patients who have trichomoniasis. The older method of diagnosing trichomoniasis was by saline wet mount. This is still performed, although some newer methods have come out that are starting to replace this. But again, it's still performed. It's a cheaper method of diagnosis, but it has a lower sensitivity. So essentially, you look at the vaginal discharge under a microscope, and you can essentially see these trichomonas vaginalis organisms on the wet mount. And then some other newer methods of diagnosis includes nucleic acid amplification tests, or PCRs. So this increases the sensitivity quite substantially. And then molecular tests. So there are a wide variety of kits that can be used to make the diagnosis. Some of these are trichomonas assays or trichomonas rapid tests. So there are a lot of company kits that can be used to make the diagnosis as well. And because there's such a high rate of co-occurrence with other STIs, it's important to test for those other STIs like chlamydia and gonorrhea. And it's also important to test or look for bacterial vaginosis. So as mentioned before, bacterial vaginosis is associated with trichomoniasis as well. And then there are other tests and findings that can be employed. So a WIF test may be performed when looking at the vaginal discharge. So a WIF test is where there is a drop of KOH or potassium hydroxide that is placed onto the vaginal discharge and it will produce a very strong fishy smell. That would be a positive WIF test. 
This is less common to find this in trichomoniasis, but it is a very important finding in bacterial vaginosis. So if you actually have a positive whiff test, it's likely that this is bacterial vaginosis. We can also see a higher vaginal pH, so a vaginal pH greater than 4.5. And if patients have pap smears performed, these organisms may actually be seen on the pap smear. So that's also something I want to make note of as well. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat it? So this condition may actually be self-limiting in males, but it's still important to treat because of some of those complications we talked about before. And if it's not treated, it may remain subclinical, meaning that the symptoms are not as severe, they become more and more mild over time, but the patient is still infected. So they can become subclinical or they may resolve on their own. But again, it's important to treat this condition because of all those complications we talked about before. So the treatment of trichomoniasis is going to be by metronidazole or tinidazole. Now what's going to be important with regards to treatment of trichomoniasis is that it's going to be important to treat both partners simultaneously. So treating both partners at the same time. So if you were to only treat one partner, what can happen is we can have something called the ping pong effect. So the ping pong effect is essentially where this infection can ping pong or go back and forth between partners. So that's why it's important to treat partners simultaneously. If you were to treat them delayed, if you were to treat one a little later than the other, what can happen is if you treat one partner, that treated partner can then have a resolution, but then the untreated partner can spread it back to the treated partner. And then if you were to treat that other person, they will have a resolution, but then you would have another person that has that infection again. So it can ping pong back and forth if you don't actually treat it simultaneously. So that's why it's going to be important. And you may be thinking if a person has this and they have a resolution, this may actually improve their immunity, but that's not the case either because previous infection does not provide substantial immunity to reinfection. So each time is going to be important to treat this. And with regards to using metronidazole, it's going to either be a one-time dose of two grams, or it's going to be a seven-day course of 500 milligrams twice per day. Now, Oftentimes, patients are going to have the two gram single dose because it's often easier for the patient. But in some cases, some research suggests that if a patient has HIV, it may be better to actually treat them with the 500 milligrams twice daily, every day for seven days. So that certain regimen may be better for those patients. And then if metronidazole doesn't work, and if metronidazole doesn't work, tinidazole will be the one that will be used. And when using metronidazole or tinidazole, it's important to avoid alcohol consumption during the treatment because of a disulfiram-like reaction. So essentially, if you're drinking alcohol when taking these antibiotics, it can make you sick. And it's also important for clinicians to consider empiric treatment for chlamydia and gonorrhea because they co-occur so frequently. Sometimes empiric treatments, simply treating for chlamydia and gonorrhea with other antibiotics can be important to simply remove that chance that they may actually have chlamydia and gonorrhea. So please check out my lesson on bacterial vaginosis and also chlamydia and gonorrhea. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.